right, <clears throat> let's get going again. <clears throat> so, I want to do a, a, a brief introduction to the idea of <clears throat> weather and climate and how this begins to impact the, the buildings. And I'll touch on some of the other <clears throat> topics that we'll be looking at in the coming weeks in sort of like the whole lecture on one topic. But I wanted to just do a brief introduction of a series of the, those topics to start. So the weather and climate, you've probably taken all of this in, in high school geography somewhere, but it begins to impact the, the environment that we live in. And so depending where you are, we have different sort of climate zones. I've touched briefly already on the climate regions of Canada. So even within Canada, very specifically, depending where you are working, you are going to be dealing with climates that are either uh, drier, cooler, sunnier, colder. We'll talk um, next week in detail on solar geometry and the way that the, <clears throat> the, the distance from the equator combined with our solar angles time of year is going to impact not only the way the sun hits the building, enters the building, <coughs> So now you can see we've got some nice bounce sunlight that's coming from the west, bouncing onto those lovely bright, shiny aluminum frames and right into, into the room. So we don't have direct sunlight, but we've got reflected sunlight based on sort of sun angles. One really important um, piece of physics that we need to keep in mind when we design buildings for passive design, buildings that try really hard by virtue of the way you design them to be keep warm and cool on their own. And that is the, the notion of the words thermal mass. So thermal mass is what we could call a container for free heat. So just like water, free solar energy, heat from the sun needs somewhere to be stored to be useful. So if somebody offers you water, you say, sure, I'd like water. And you don't give them a glass and then you just pour the water, pour it on your head, pour it in your mouth, like there's only so much your mouth can hold and then you're going to drown. Likewise, if we want heat, it's sort of like the solar version of water. If we don't have somewhere to store it, it will, it will, just, it will just accumulate <coughs> full away. So um, when we're thinking about sun, if we don't have a thermal mass, if we just have um, insulation materials, there's nowhere to store it. So thermal mass would be materials like concrete, brick, something that has the, the ability to store heat. And so when we design our buildings, we need to make sure that if we've got windows for the, for the sun to come in and the heat to come in in the wintertime, that we have somewhere to put it. Because the, the bottom line fact is that humans are 80% water, and water is really good thermal mass. So water is quite capable of holding heat. So if the sun is shining in the window and you're standing in a room that's completely covered with beautiful 1970s shag carpet and nice wood on the floor and wood on the ceiling and all these materials that cannot store the heat, that the sun comes in and it looks around and it says like, you. You're 80% water, and then all the heat goes into you. And you're, you're going like, what's going on? Why am I so hot? Well, you're hot because the heat's gravitating towards you because you are thermal mass. So the only way to keep people comfortable in space, interior spaces, is to make sure there's thermal building mass in sufficient quantity that it can absorb the heat and not the people. So the problem with a lot of 1970s architecture, when people were first starting to think about environmental design and south-facing windows and all this kind of stuff was that they didn't understand the concept of thermal mass and so they were trying to just roll through with sort of standard 1970s attitudes towards design without changing the materials and they ended up with really, really uncomfortable buildings. Buildings that had massive south-facing windows that, that people couldn't stand to be in because they were so hot. You need to have a balance of thermal mass. You have to have the right number. So if you, after this lecture's over, if you go down to the south stairwell, I want you to walk down the south stairwell. He's going, no. <laughs> so yeah. 
make me do it. It's hot. It's really hot in there because even though there's some thermal mass, there's not that much because there's some drywall on the walls, there's some wood on the floor, and there's windows facing south and west. So there's way too much glass for that space. So it's really, really hot right now. But you should go and experience it so that you, you understand what is meant by having to balance it out because you're going in there and you are the thermal mass and you are absorbing the heat. Now in the winter time, that's a lovely place to go and hang out because there's you're the thermal mass and you go in there and you, you, can, you can nicely warm up because the sun's going to shine on you. So one of the things that we've, we've challenges that we face when we're designing buildings, and this also goes back to this notion of the wood frame houses that we are accustomed now to building in, in Canada, Southern Ontario in particular, is that in order for the idea of thermal mass to work, the thermal mass needs to be on the inside of the building. You need the concrete, the brick, sort of the heavy Mexican tiles, all these kind of materials that can hold heat <coughs> inside. Well, the way that we design buildings here is that we have brick and we put it on outside as a veneer, as sort of this fancy decoration to make it sort of look like an old-fashioned brick house when it's not. And so all the thermal mass is outside. Inside, we've got drywall, which doesn't hold much heat. We've got carpet and wood and bad insulation. And so, bass, not bad, B-A-T-T. And so we have nothing inside the building to hold the heat. So one of the things that we have to do in architecture is to try to say, okay, let's not build like that. We need to build and put the insulation on the, on the outside, as this is showing the pink, and have the thermal mass on the inside. So if we look at just a regular uninsulated wall, which would be a lot of those Cambridge houses, uh, one of the issues with uninsulated buildings, not only do they lose heat, but they, they gain heat. So if you're in any one of those houses right now, I bet you they're really, really hot if you don't have air conditioning because they just, they just keep getting warm. When I came home on the weekend and I knew I was feeling sick, I, I texted my daughter. First of all, I texted my husband, and that's almost like a useless thing to do. So I said, I think, I think, because to explain, I pay the, hi the hydro and the heat bills at the house. We sort of divvy up bills. I pay the heat and hydro, and therefore I am allowed to dictate the temperatures that the house is, is permitted to be at. So I am in charge of the thermostat. And so generally speaking, when I travel, no one dares touch the thermostat because they know if I come home and it's messed up, I'll scream at people. So I, I, I messaged my husband and I said, I, I see that, because it was beautiful in Vancouver, I have gorgeous temperatures. So I see by looking at the weather network that you are like at humidex of 40, I think you really should put the air conditioning on. Like shut the windows, put the air conditioning on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I messaged on Sunday when I'm at the airport flying home, feeling I really don't want to go home to that heat. Messaged my daughter and said, is the air on? Did Dad put the air on? Oh, no. He didn't. So I well, can you put the air on? Well, by the time I got home at night, it was still 80 in the house. I walked into the house. Because our house has no insulation, it's just, it, it takes forever for air conditioning to actually suck the heat out of the walls because they've spent the last month becoming whatever temperature it is outside, like 29 Celsius, that's what they are. So it took 48 hours. I got it from 80 down to 78 in the house, <laughs> just running the air conditioning on full because when you're in a situation where you've got no insulation, you've got basically 12 inches of thermal mass that has absorbed the heat. So if it's 29 or 30 outside, gets to be 29 or 30 inside, the wall is the same temperature. And so in order to cool it, you have to have enough cool temperature running across that wall in order to take that, that temperature out. So the idea as well, when we have our, our contemporary buildings that have our masonry except on the other side, is that the insulation is on the inside, and so again, we don't get any benefit of that, that thermal mass. So, 
So the best case scenario is when we have the thermal mass on the inside and the insulation on the outside. Drastic simplification, and we'll talk more about different kinds of details. But just so that you have a, the, the understanding, the words thermal mass, what they can be, concrete, water, brick, and that it's best to have them inside. So I'll talk next week about solar geometry, but, but the sun is extraordinarily important to passive design because it's how we're going to be getting free heat and free light. And to this point, people keep speculating that someday somebody's going to figure out how to charge us for the sun. But so far, no one's managed to do it. And so from the point of view of passive architecture, you know, well, I don't have any lights on in this room. I've got the windows open. We're getting free light from there. I could shut the blinds and turn lights on, but why would we do that? And so we'll talk more next week about all of the different sun angles, how, how the equinox is important, the solstices are important, and we will use that to, to go through detailed design of shading devices because what <coughs> the bottom line is <coughs> is that you need to have the shading devices designed differently for every facade of the building. Because of the way that the sun comes around buildings, it's high at noon, it's low at the, the morning and afternoon, that the way that it sweeps across the sky means that it's going to either come above your sort of roof overhang or under your roof overhang. And so if you don't understand how the geometry of that works, then you can't properly design the facade to accommodate it. Coupled with that, the sun hitting glass in, in you know, the ye olde days when we had single glazing, this would have been the, the scenario, the base scenario for how sun comes through the glass. A lot of the heat would be transmitted through the glass because it was a thing, single thickness and it wasn't a, a double or a triple insulating glass. You'd get some reflected, and you'd get some heat that would get absorbed because the glass just basically heats up if it's in the sun, and then it's going to radiate back out. The different kinds of glass that you can select also have uh, the ability to, to moderate the amount of light that gets and heat that gets transmitted through the glass. So if you're looking at what we would think of as being just plain clear glass, a three millimeter thick sheet of glass, about 78 to 87% of the solar radiation goes through that glass. If we go and look at some of those uh, Scott high rise towers downtown, not downtown Cambridge, downtown Toronto, downtown big city, where you have reflective glass on them, there's an actual metal coating on that, and anywhere from 3 to 29% of the solar radiation will get through that. So those, those kind of heavy tints are specifically designed to keep the heat out and have worked pretty successfully to cut down on some of the cooling costs for skyscrapers by virtue of the, the kind of glass that they put on. The interesting part, though, of skyscraper design is that the, the uh, reflective glass of the 1970s and early 80s so we had the Royal Bank Plaza in Toronto, the gold one. We have some silver towers at University Avenue, the Sun Life Towers. We've got ones with sort of a rosy pink reflective glass. All those reflective glass towers were of a certain period. And architects kind of went, no, we don't like to do that anymore. What's in vogue now is clear glass. We want nice, clear glass. And so what happened is that the, the skyscrapers of the 70s and 80s were having less of a problem with the heat, heat buildup in them because the glass that was used by the architects was cutting down on the heat. So swap that out with the stuff at the top that's letting most of the heat in. All of a sudden, there's extreme cooling problems as well as overheating in a lot of the offices because most high-rise offices that you would go into have carpeted floors, drywall on the walls, and water-based people inside. So the people tend to get hot. 
And so we also have, um, so looking at, at that kind of in detail, we've got basically the clear glass that lets the most heat go through it in terms of gain. We've got reflective glass that bounces quite a bit out. We get the least amount of heat coming in. And then we've got heat absorbing glasses or tinted glasses that take somewhere in the middle in terms of how much heat is going to be reflected out and how much heat is going to be allowed in. <coughs> So we'll talk in detail about uh, using simple overhangs to shade because, as I said, a big umbrella is better than a small one. And so that big umbrella is not only, in, in, in the case of our building, protecting us from the rain, but it's also protecting us from the sun. So we'll look next week uh, and the week after at some more complicated shading devices and how to decide how big they should be. So the other um, aspect that of, of physics that really impacts the building is heat flow. As I've mentioned before in this class, it flows from hot to cold. And so the building envelope follows those rules. And so the, the materials that we select are either conductive in terms of conductive to heat flow, or they will insulate, which means that they have resistance to heat flow. And so the nature of the materials that we select to make up our buildings have to take this physics into account. So the way that we <coughs> reference the ability of a material to resist heat flow is in terms of its R value, which is short for resistance value. So if you're designing a building, that's going to be in yellow knife, they may have a required R value of the wall assembly of six. Okay? You're designing in, in yellow knife, uh, walls need to have an R value of six. And you go, great, what's that? How do I get to that? In Ontario, maybe the R value required here is 3.5. So R value is about resistance. So the bigger the R value, the bigger the resistance, the more insulation you've got in the wall. So we, we refer to walls and opaque materials in general as having an R value or a resistance value to heat flow. And we want those numbers to be big. When we speak of things like windows that have very negligible resistance to heat flow, we talk about them as being conductance. And so the U value <coughs> is generally what we talk about when we talk about windows. And it's very simply the inverse of R. So I know you had to do all that math in high school. Hopefully you can do that one. R is 1 over U. And U is 1 over R. So it's just the inverse. And the reason that we do that is just to confuse you, although it probably succeeds to do that for the, for the most part. But it has to do with the fact that U values are stupid looking numbers. This is my best math terms. Because some U values are like this. And you're writing that down and you go like, how many zeros? It's so much easier when you take something and, and make an inverse of it because the number gets less zeros. And so frankly, it's a very pragmatic reason why we do U values instead of R values, and it's just to start to manage all those digits. Um, the other thing, too, is that the um, R value, when we talk about units, we're talking about meters squared. So we're talking about the area of the building envelope. Okay, so meters squared. <laughs> talking about degrees Celsius and basically it's about delta T. So it's the temperature difference from in to out. How much can it 
how much would it drop across that? And then watts is just energy. Not just our value of energy that we're dealing with in, in Canada. And so if we say that the, the units of resistance is meters squared times degrees Celsius per watts, it's kind of like, okay, what does that mean? I don't know. It makes no sense at all. But if we talk about units of conductance, then it's the amount of watts, amount of energy per square meter of building envelope based on the temperature differential, which as, as far as units of measure to me make much more sense than that one. Doesn't make any sense at all. So if we think about a bigger building, so if a building that has 10 square meters of surface area versus a building that would have 1,000 square meters of surface area, the building that has 1,000 square meters of surface area is going to have more material to lose heat energy through. If the change in temperature from inside to outside is nothing, then we have a not real number, sorry. But we won't have any heat flow, because you can't have zero on the bottom. Um, but if we have a huge temperature differential, then we're going to have more heat flow that needs to be resisted. And we'll talk more about our value. Well, we do a whole lecture on that next term, like three hours just on our value. It's, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> Don't worry. <clears throat> Buildings are like radiators. So the way that these old cast iron radiators work is there's hot water that's flowing through them, and they have a lot of surface area. So the more surface area that that radiator has in contact with the air of the room, the more heat can escape from that radiator. Make sense? So buildings that are small and compact lose less heat than buildings that are all kind of you know, gnarly with all sorts of walls on them. So if I look at a, a floor plan of a building, this is my floor plan. I'm just going to divide it up into these little blocks. Okay, so I've got 10, 10 squares, right? So that's got a certain amount of surface area on the perimeter. Right? So my surface area on the perimeter is 10, 14, right? Just linear. We don't know how tall a building is, but linear. But if I took that and said, oh, but this is so boring, I'm going to do pavilions. Two pavilions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put pavilions in the landscape. And so I'm going to take these 10 things and I'm just going to add them, distribute them all around. Then all of a sudden, instead of having a perimeter of 14, I've got 10 <coughs> times 4, I've got a perimeter of 40. Which means that the heat loss from those is going to be almost three times as much. <coughs> Because all of a sudden, there's all those perimeter walls that are losing heat as opposed to just the ones on the, on the direct outside. So when we start to you know, look at trying to make energy efficient buildings, then we start to balance out with design the fact that we don't necessarily want everything to be really boring and, rect and everything's rectangles and we might as well just pack it in. But on the other hand, we, we would look at that and go, well, can we, can we justify putting every single one by itself, like maybe if we clustered them together, we could have a little less exterior wall area. Or maybe <clears throat> if we're looking at passive design and saying that these are, little, these are little cabins, you know, at some camp that they force you to go to and, and, and you know, do orienteering at that doesn't have any heat or hydro or whatever like that in the summertime, <laughs> you say, well, but if they're outside and we're getting, you know, nice cross ventilation, and they're nice and breezy, that's a good thing, so it's not a heat loss issue, it's a natural ventilation issue, and they work better standalone. Whereas if all these people are in like a dorm corridor down the middle, and everyone wants privacy and their doors shut, you don't really get really good cross ventilation just coming in and out one wall. And so this would actually be more pleasant to sleep in than that place with all the doors shut. 
So, you know, we, we, it's, it's never just a, a straight up black and white issue. There are always things that we balance, <laughs> questions that we ask. So that's not yes or no, it's maybe, uh, maybe not, and what can we do with this in order to maybe leverage something. So the idea that buildings are like radiators, surface area, more surface area, more heat escapes. So if you look at the, <coughs> the Royal Bank building in Toronto that has this sort of sawtooth facade with this 45 degree angle, it's about 45% more surface area than if it was a rectangle. Right? By doing the, by doing the sawtooth. <coughs> versus that. So we've got 45% more surface area to have the heat escape. We've got 45% more wall to buy, to buy, like 45% more curtain wall, and that has real gold on it. That's not fake gold, that's real gold making that gold color. <coughs> I can always tell it, you know, as times have changed since I've been teaching here, as to what people's, what buildings people talk about in their admission interviews to try to impress the committee. And for many, many years, you'd, you'd ask them, you know, what, what's your favorite piece of, what's your favorite building in Toronto? That gold building. <laughs> like, it was like they were in raptures, oh, the gold building. And then people would say the CN Tower, and you go like, that's a piece of engineering. It's not a piece of architecture. <laughs> and then they cry. <laughs> so again, when you, when you are insulating, more is more. Um, one of the things we have to start to look at with respect to this insulation and the more, the more is more is, again, dealing with our standard practices. So standard practices in, in Canada for construction is wood frame for houses, and stuff those walls full of that fiberglass bat insulation. Well, uh, when, I was, when I was growing up in, in Kitchener, I hung out with a lot, of, a lot of people who, like they dropped out after grade 10. I'm just one of these people that it's just a miracle that somehow I hung around with all the wrong people, and I ended up going to university, and they all dropped out after grade 10, got married after grade 12, were divorced before anybody, I was in grade 13. It was just incredible. But a lot of them worked for a, a, a fiberglass, some of the guys worked for a fiberglass uh, manufacturing plant outside of uh, Waterloo. And the stories coming home of people with, with cancer from, from breathing in fiberglass fibers. This was pretty, pretty sad because people were in a manufacturing facility and nobody understood it at that time that all those little glass fibers that were not just in, they had gloves on to handle the stuff. People weren't thinking about them floating around in the air and it, it gave people lung cancer. So fiberglass bat insulation is not the nicest <coughs> material, although it is the cheapest insulation material. And so we have to start to think about more sustainable kinds of insulation <coughs> that are less harmful to human health for both the manufacturers and the installers. Um, as well, that can make a, you know, a good, uh, that have a higher insulation value. So you can actually take soybeans and turn it into a, a spray foam insulation. And soybeans are a renewable project, pro product rather than, there's other spray foam insulation that's made out of petrochemicals. When if, petrochemicals are not sustainable nor are they renewable, and they're highly flammable. Did any of you follow this past year the, the Grenfell Tower fire in, in London, United Kingdom? Most, all, those, all those people died, 24-story building that just went up like poof. Well, the problem with the facade on that building, and again, you're looking at are materials tested or not, but they decided it was an old 70s, ugly 70s brute building, made out of like brick and concrete. And so they decided to upgrade it for energy and they decided to tart up the facade so that the rich people in the neighborhood looking at it didn't have to look at an ugly, brutalist, poor people's apartment complex. So they put metal panels on the outside which might have been about, they're aluminum core, they're about that thick. But they're full of 
what keeps it stiff is the kind of insulation. And then there was an airspace, and then the existing wall, whatever it was, masonry. But this was a kind of um, polystyrene, <coughs> highly flammable insulation. And so what happened in the building was that there was a refrigerator that caught on fire, and of course there's defects in the building, and so the fire ended up coming out of here, started this on fire, which was a very, a very massive fuel load of something that's highly flammable, just because it's a petrochemical-based foam insulation. There was an airspace that went clean up the building, now, in, in Canada, we've been doing rain screens for a lot longer, I guess, than they have in the United Kingdom. And one of the things that we understand that we need to do in a, in, a, in a wall when we make a cavity is we need to fire stop it. We need to break it. You don't take something 24 stories up a building and make a cavity 24 stories up the building because it means it can just go, whoosh, which is what it did, right up the building. And then this particular product, <coughs> is also in question because it's a, a, an aluminum sandwich panel, but they have two choices of what to put inside here. There's one that burns, and there's one that doesn't burn. <coughs> According to the building code and any normal <coughs> brain, you put the one in here that doesn't burn, but I guess honestly, if this is flammable, what did that matter? When you're looking at, you know, the overall death toll, I mean, seriously. But there have been other, other instances where this has been used without that and this. So in the the um, the address fire in in Dubai, where they had the big hotel tower across from the Burj Khalifa that caught fire the same night as the fireworks. So they've got the fire purposeful fireworks going on on one side. And they've got an entire uh, high-rise hotel that's like 300 meters tall that's in flames right opposite. It was covered with this as well. And so this was not fire stopped, and so it, it, it just burnt up the facade. So there are, you know, insulation choices where we have to say, well, you know, something like that wouldn't have been flammable. Anything made out of rock wool, which is actually made out of rocks, not... Um, Plastic would not have been flammable. The soy stuff was not flammable. The way that you can use this kind of material is if you enclose it behind drywall or a gypsum board, but you're not going to put drywall in, in an exterior wall cavity. So there's a lot of things that we have to look at with respect to our insulation, our choices, and our detailing. Um, that's really critical. It's, it's going to be very interesting in a kind of sad way to watch the, um, the, uh, the fallout of the, of the Grenfell Tower fire. Um, I'm, I'm trying to finish writing a paper on it and it's just, I've been sick and I've been, it's not going very well. Um, you know, even, even profs have deadline issues. Like, oh my God, when am I gonna finish that paper? It's due on Saturday. Actually, I had to call and ask, I emailed and asked for an extension. I felt like a, a student, but. <laughs> But they're going to be charging people involved with that in, with manslaughter. The architect had given over the drawings. The the city, the town council, because it was a, a project for owned by the, the the town council, was owned by them, and so then they made a, an executive decision to save a couple a couple hundred pounds of cost by subbing in the material that they should not have used, even though it was te technically not permitted. But the, the company that's manufacturing it is also on the hook because they should know that if they're getting an order for a 24-story tower for the flammable material that isn't permitted, they should have said something, not just <clears throat> sold it to them. So they are <coughs> complicit. So it's going to be a, a pretty interesting uh, law lawsuit. And uh, uh, it's as a result, the manufacturer who's ma who manufactured the, the product, which, by the way, is legal to use on buildings that are six stories or less, even in Canada. We're allowed to use the flammable one on short buildings. It's okay if short buildings burn up, it's not <coughs> tall buildings. They're actually taking it off the market altogether, which was interesting to, to find out that they're at least being proactive enough to say, 
nobody seems to be able to be trusted with specifying this because another thing I was reading is that if you look at the panels, look at the side view of the sandwich panel, it's not clear when you look at it which is which. Like sometimes you go and, 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 and look at a, you go to the grocery store and you're going like, okay, the generic baking soda versus the, the cow brand baking soda. Like, they both look like baking soda. Like, what's the difference? Or what's the difference between baking powder and baking soda? They're both white powders. I'm not sure. But these ones, you look at them and you can't really tell. And so they took it off the market. Now, on the other hand, they've had these same high-rise fires in Dubai, a couple of them. In Melbourne, Australia, they've also had but a different manufacturer. So the manufacturer of the product that's used in Melbourne that was used in a couple of fire towers that went on fire come from China. And so I was trying to track on these projects which is the product that was used on which tower for the fire. What does the manufacturer say about the pro product of anything? Because if an architect is specifying a, a product, you think you should be able to go to the manufacturer's website and get some reasonably accurate specification information that might suggest this is good for this kind of building or that kind of building. So I, was, I finally found the manufacturer for the one that was used on, in the Melbourne Tower fire. And it's a Chinese manufacturer. And, and not only do they not say this is flammable or not flammable, best Building Product Award from a Malaysia 2014 Use Our Product. It's an award-winning product. So not only are they not taking it off the, the market, they're promoting it as being really amazing for use as cladding on towers. So it's, it's an interesting globe that we live in. <coughs> and because you work all over the world eventually, you have to know how it works all over the world and, and uh, be skeptical of certain regulations. Your building practices might be laughed at when you go certain places. They say, oh, we always do that here. Always use that highly flammable material on buildings. So temperature, we need to look at the drive of the temperature. Heat flows from higher temperature to low. So when we're looking at a cold climate, if it's minus, minus 23 outside and we're trying to keep it at plus 23C in the inside, that's a 46 Celsius temperature <coughs> difference, which means the heat's trying desperately to get out of the building. But, you know, when it's kind of 18 out and 23C inside, there's not that much of a push. So there's not that much flow that happens. So part of the problem when, uh, when it only cools off a little bit at night and you have your windows open and say it's you know, 29, 30 degrees Celsius inside your house and it only went down to like 21 last night, you've only got a, a nine degree temperature difference. It's not enough to really push it in terms of trying to make the heat leave. So what we begin to do <coughs> is to understand how that temperature differential works as it goes through the walls of, our, of our, our third skin. So if we talk about a massive wall with no insulation in it, like my house or that house in Egypt or the sort of adobe house, half your houses in Cambridge with no um, <coughs> insulation, this wall, has no insulation. So what's this? It says the interior temperature feels nice and cool. Um, because it's cooler than my hand. My hand is warm. It's cooler, hot, flowing into the wall. So we get a straight line. It's just a straight line. So if you if you plotted that temperature through the wall, it's a straight line. If you start to put insulation in, you can see the lines of the spikes up through the middle because you're getting the most benefit of the. It's bringing the most temperature change in the wall through the insulation. If we put the insulation in the cavity with the structural wall here, you can see that the outside temperature goes basically straight across. We get most of our um, resistance heat flow happening, and then it kind of levels off because this doesn't have much insulation value. And if we put the insulation on the inside, 
can see it, most of the resistance to heat flow happens here, levels off, and then out. So that means that the structural wall in the wintertime is getting really cold, summertime is getting really hot, so if it's really hot out, then the temperatures could be going up, so which says that, which is another really good reason to have the insulation outboard and the thermal mass structural wall inside, it keeps the temperature pretty stable on that wall. <coughs> so it doesn't have to expand and contract and do all sorts of things. Dew point. So there's a certain amount of humidity in the air. The dew point is the temperature at which the air of a certain level of humidity <coughs> will have water droplets come out of it. So if you have, in the wintertime, say you're cooking pasta, and you look at the kitchen window, and it's covered with humidity. It wasn't covered with humidity before you started to cook pasta, just all of a sudden it's covered with humidity because the glass is cold. It's obviously at a temperature which will take the vapor that's in the air when it touches that glass it gets cooled to the dew point and water droplets come out. So what we're trying to do is to not have that water droplet stuff come out in or on our envelope. So we can get bad drip condensation on glass, which looks really, really awful. There was a pizza place I used to take my daughter to by school in Toronto, and it was a single glass pizza pizza envelope. And you'd go in there in the in the winter time, and the whole thing was gross because all of the glass was just dripping with water. And it was just like the most unappetizing pizza aside. It was the most unappetizing place to eat because the envelope was so obviously substandard and bad, but it was, a, it was single glass, and that's what the inside always looked like in, in the winter time. The, this one here, you've got a you know, situation where there's so much moisture at the windowsill, and, and condensation that, in fact, there's black mold growing. <coughs> Another one of the major, major evils that you must avoid are thermal bridges. And a thermal bridge is a place in the building envelope where there is no resistance to flow and the heat just goes out. So if you look at most um, say 1970s vintage apartment buildings where you look at the outside of the apartment building and you can count the number of floors because you see slab, 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 slab with brick, brick, brick in between. Like that, which means that what they did was built a concrete frame tower and they inserted the envelope between, which means that at every floor, there's no insulation. So all of the heat is simply escaping at that point through the building envelope. <laughs> now, it's not illegal. In, according to the building code, there's a certain percentage of thermal bridges that you are permitted to have in your building envelope. But it creates really bad um, performance as far as energy goes. And it can create really hideous building science related defects or conditions on the inside of the building in terms of water and mold. So when you're detailing building envelopes, and we'll look at this in various instances through in the, in the building instruction course, mostly you need to avoid those thermal bridges. So this is the cover of Green Source magazine, this is Aqua Tower in, um, in Chicago that was designed as a radiator. The more surface area you have exposed, the more heat you lose, so that every single slab that comes out of the edge here is designed as a radiator. It out, there's no, there's no thermal break, it's just air, like um, wear surrounding that concrete pulling the heat out of the building. Nothing put in there, just the glass jamming in between. So if you think about a really inefficient envelope that has mostly glass, which is performed so much less well than insulation would, and 
in concrete fins. Really expensive project, too. So just because it's an expensive project or a famous project doesn't mean that it's good. So that is essentially the classic bad balcony detail, but on a really expensive skyscraper in Chicago. So what you can get as, a, as warm, warm air rises, you can get mold and damage to the finishes up here. And then uh, on the floor, the condensation that will form may actually either, if you've got carpet there, it could mold it, or if you've got like a wood flooring, like parquet flooring or something, it can dissolve the glue and, and cause the, the tiles to come up. I remember when I moved into my, my, my apartment on Isabella Street when I was a student. It was, it was really cool to finally have my own bachelor pad. I didn't room with anybody. It was just mine. I was very excited about it. So I, you walk in and you've got, it's just, it's just a bachelor thing, so it was a very small place. But I walked up to the, the big sliding glass doors to the balcony. So yeah, you know, thinking back now, I stepped on those, the parquet tile floor at the, near the door why are the tiles all loose? Has there been a flood? Like, has there been water at the door? I'm like, how could there be a flood? I'm on the 21st floor. Where's the water coming from? So I didn't pay any attention to that. And then I, in order to have some privacy, because there was another building across from us, I, I bought some floor-to-ceiling curtains. So they had these nice curtains that went across the wall, like a student with curtains. It was just amazing to have curtains on my windows. And the, the outside wall was a metal panel, metal sandwich panel system. And so the outside wall would be like balcony, sliding glass door, and the rest of the wall was a, a metal sandwich panel about, I don't know, about that thick with insulation. Well, when I went to move out, and I took the curtains down, where the curtains passed in front of the metal panel part of the wall, it was covered with black mold because it had been insulating that wall and trapping all the humidity um, behind the curtains. And it was just the grossest thing. I could, I could just think, this was in my apartment. I didn't realize it, because I'd gone from sort of the wall-to-wall -wall thing as an, as an effect, not just to, to cover the, the door. The other thing that we end up with in our buildings, and I touched on it when I talked about the Ramada Inn and the snow inside, is the fact that any that air and air vapor can move through walls. And we, we call this exfiltration or air leakage. And there's two kinds of instances, one that goes right through the materials and one that goes through cracks. But in any case, what the critical problem is, and it wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for this, that there's moisture in the wall and the air and when it goes through the wall, it cools, hits its dew point, and condenses. And that means you can get water inside your wall. And water inside your wall is not good. Because if it condenses in your insulation, it can get it all soggy, and it's not so effective anymore. <coughs> so it can either go through walls or through cracks. So I, I talk about vapor going through walls, which is called vapor diffusion. Think of it like a ghost, where ghosts just go through the wall. Ghosts don't go through cracks. They go right through the wall. Last I've seen, right through the wall. And so that's like vapor diffusion. And so what's happening when the vapor goes right through the wall that as it cools down and, and hits its dew point, it's depositing moisture. And what you can see happening in some buildings, if there's salts or some other deposits in the wall that shouldn't be there, then it will actually, it will actually carry that through and make sort of white salty deposits called efflorescence <laughs> on the outside. But that's vapor diffusion, goes right through the wall. Air leakage. <coughs> is when the air goes through the crack. So not vapor, air. So air that wind that blows is going through cracks. And again, as the air goes through cracks, the moisture in it will condense and then cause problems. 
And so the way that the air escapes, because you're thinking, well, I just built this house. Where are all the cracks? <coughs> Everywhere something joins, at every connection of two materials, there could be a space. Um, around electrical outlets, if they're in the outside wall, there could be a space around that where air is coming out. If you have a fireplace, fans, vents, doors without good weather stripping around, windows without good weather stripping around, all these places, the air can just go right through the wall. And so that's just a diagram of some of the sort of air leakage paths in houses. <coughs> a particular <coughs> problem would be when you have bathrooms on upper floors that any moisture that's in that bathroom can actually very easily escape through light fixture pockets, etc., <coughs> up into the attic. We had our, our friends that lived in Boston um, had a, a nice house, and we went down to visit them once, and there was a big problem that the ceiling in their master bathroom had just collapsed. And, you know, just what you want to have happen as you've got company coming for the weekend. And we kind of looked at it, and what their builder had done is they took the, the vent from the bathroom, and instead of having the bathroom vent go through a, a tube of air, the air would go through a tube that would go to the outside of the building and exhaust that hot, sweaty bathroom air outside, cheaped out, and he just let it vent into the attic. So all that moist air that was in the bathroom was therefore accumulating in the bat insulation in the ceiling that was right above the master bathroom, soaked the drywall, and then the whole ceiling caved in. Yeah. So those are all the causes for our moisture. And so we have to then address this through diffusion or exfiltration, through ghosts or cracks, stopping that process so it doesn't end up in the building envelope. So one thing that was invented early on in the 1960s was the idea of a vapor barrier. So it was realized through studies that were done at the National, Re National Research Council in Ottawa that if we simply had these the frame buildings that were getting all this insulation put into them, if they didn't have something to stop the, the vapor diffusing through the wall, that it would be bringing the moisture with it and there was condensation happening. So they were doing studies on buildings that had issues, like somebody would rip apart a wall and go, wow, look at it, it's black and rotten inside and everything's wet. Why? So that's just what scientists do. They go, I wonder what's happening. Uh, so they, they realized that if they put a, a vapor barrier, which is that plastic sheet material that you see that goes on the, the inside of the fiberglass bat insulation, then it's going to stop that vapor from going through. So the vapor barrier became to be a, a, a practice of always putting it on warm side of the insulation in order to keep the diffused um, moist air in the house, in, on the inside, not going through. That only was effective for so long, and then people were opening up walls that still had problems. They had problems behind the electrical outlets that were in the outside wall. They had problems at, <laughs> at joints and at ceiling, where the ceiling was joining to the wall, etc. And they realized that maybe only 10% of the vapor was going through the wall moisture, 90% of it was going through cracks. So then they started to take a different approach to, to sealing up and tightening up the building. So, in combination with this, there are also problems with these vapor barriers. And, and John Straub, when he teaches you Arch 364, will give you a, a very thorough view of the problems associated with the continued use of vapor barriers in that the problem is that if water does get inside the wall, and they're not perfect and water does, then it gets trapped inside the wall because it can't dry out. And so the, the sort of the jury is still out on whether or not we should be even putting that stuff in the wall and instead <coughs> looking more at the ceiling of the cracks because that's where the majority of the, the um, air is leaking. 
And so again, it's just can't, you know, the eyelight mold is just super bad problem. If you find you have black mold in your apartment, you should like move out. It's toxic. I had one of one of the one of my master's students was living in one of the apartments over on uh, the really nice looking brick building. It's on uh, is that Maine? No, it's water. I think it's water. Anyway, he was in, and he, he ended up with a serious lung infection because there was mold in the apartment. They had to get it cleaned, but he ended up you know with with a with a, a bad lung infection because of mold in some place he was living. So some people are more susceptible than others, but yeah, black mold's toxic. So then, in the 1980s, <coughs> so air vapor barriers were 1960s. 20 years later, air barriers were invented, where they realized after studies of failed walls that the, um, the cracks were the problem. And so then they started to look at how do you make <coughs> walls that are barriers to air going through. And some materials work better than others. Like glass is a pretty good air barrier. Air doesn't go through glass. Air doesn't go through metal. Air doesn't go through really heavy concrete. Air does go through concrete block because it's more porous. So they started to look at how to construct the building envelope to control air leakage. And we'll talk more about this detailing next term. But I just wanted to, to bring up the, the two major classifications of a vapor barrier that's controlling vapor that's in the air like a ghost going right through the wall versus air barriers, which essentially is a system of putting the building details together to seal up the cracks. It's as if you're trying to design the building as if it were a swimming pool. Right? In a swimming pool, when you make a swimming pool, you put the liner and everything in so the water doesn't get out. You don't just put you know, something in the ground and fill it with water and then kind of wait to see how long the water stays in there. Right? You want it to be sealed. And so we're trying to design buildings that can be sealed airtight <coughs> by understanding that wherever we have joints in, in, in the materials, where we have porous materials, that it can go right through. And then starting to roll all of this together. So we need to have our thermal mass. We need to have no thermal bridges. We need to have tight envelopes. So this would be a situation where um, we've got brick. It's sitting on the outside, insulation on the inside. So we have this big thermal bridge coming, coming across. So that, that scenario could be fixed by having an angle that sits out there and has insulation passing by with the, the structure on the inside. So we start to see some detailing changes progress that start to address all these kind of building science issues. And then, we're, we, have, then we have to look at the tough details where we have continuities over parapets and where things get really gnarly. But uh, you don't have to detail like that just yet. But just eventually you'll just say, oh, yeah, I need to do one of those. No problem. <coughs> Wind can be a very positive force in the built environment because uh, it can give us ventilation in our buildings, nice breezes when it's hot out. It can turn turbines to give us electricity. But wind can also be very bad as we've seen from a lot of the, the storm, storm sequences, footage from the south, where you know, entire islands have been decimated, crops have been decimated. Um, it's, it's a really sad situation. And so, I mean, we're lucky here that we don't, in Canada, have to design for such severe wind um, instances. But people who design buildings down in the south will again be revisiting their building codes. After Hurricane Andrew, I don't know how long Andrew was, no more than 10 years ago, they completely changed the Florida building code. And I've got a, a, a colleague that I, I'm friends with who actually has a practice down in Miami. And he was like really happy after the hurricane went, Irma went through, that his buildings were good. They're still here, look. 
They were built to the code. The code works. There's the test of the code. But the problem is there's a lot of buildings that are still in existence that didn't get hit by Andrew that, are, that got decimated by Irma. And so they will again look at what worked, what didn't work, and up the, up the code requirements in order to make things able to withstand the wind. And so we'll look at wind throughout the term in a little bit more detail, but understanding that as wind flows over top of a building, depending on the shape of the building, we get <coughs> positive pressures, we get suction <coughs> pressures on the roof, we get suction pressures on the back side of the building. So that's going to impact the loads on the facade, the cladding, um, airflow coming through the building, um, all sorts of things that can, that can change. Um, buildings that are up taller have different kind of wind regime at the top and bottom. There are certain urban situations where people will watch the snow and the rain that goes beside skyscrapers and it goes up instead of down just because of the way that the air is flowing around the city that all of a sudden it starts to go up and over a building and it just takes the snow and the rain in the reverse direction. <coughs> so the whole idea of wind around tall buildings. Um, next, in the winter term, we go to RWDI, which is the wind, wind engineers over in Guelph, and we'll look at their wind tunnel and, and talk a bit more about wind. But it's just important as a sort of preface to looking at natural ventilation in buildings to understand about wind and that wind is a huge field of engineering and has great impacts on architecture. So that, for example, the Swiss Ray Tower in, in London, designed by Norman Foster, <coughs> is a double facade structure. So if you look at the, the stripes that are going up this the glass on the facade, it's not just striped for fun, although I'm sure someone had fun doing that, but there are chases that go up where the dark ones are, that are triangular pieces of the building that actually have airflow going up from floor to floor. And so what they did is they put the, the building in a wind tunnel, they looked at the impact of putting a square building in that neighborhood, they looked at the pickle-shaped building, it's called the Gherkin for a reason, and they did all sorts of studies in terms of the airflow around it and the, the impact at the grade for the people walking around the building and then shaped the building based on the, the best case scenario for how the wind would work in their facade system and to keep it it's nice for people to walk at grade. Um, with respect to wind and again hot air rising, we have something called stack effect so that um, if you think about a, a building that it starts, it's cool at the bottom, it's warm at the top, so as warm air rises, it tends to want to escape the building. And then when we add wind pressures onto that, we can start to make, make it so that it's difficult for doors to open at the bottom of a building, depending on how the wind is blowing or not. I can remember as a, as a work term student, they sent me, I was, I was the only girl in the office. And it was an office, it was six guys, and then there was me, and I was in like third year or something like that. And it was a really, really super windy day. There was a big, big storm in downtown Toronto. And I worked near Bloor and Young. And they needed Bainbridge board to make a model. And so they sent me to Curry's to buy Bainbridge board. And I'm walking down Young Street, like basically like clinging to the, to the Bainbridge board with my feet not on the ground. It was that windy. But there were, there were high-rise office buildings whereby they would have to bolt the revolving doors shut because the wind regime was so strong at the bottoms of the buildings that they were just whipping around dangerously. And then the wind was so strong around the, the towers at Bank of Montreal and Commerce Place that they actually had the, the traffic cordoned off and they had ropes that were strung across the street. So people who were crossing the street did a hand over hand across the street so that they didn't blow away. So wind can give you nice breezes to cool you, but it can also be pretty devastating. There's um, all sorts of books out there on building failures, which would be are interesting to read. So you might want to like <clears throat> pick up uh, pick up some of those at the library sometime. I know Elizabeth always has you read in, um, 
injured instructor scores by building stand up. So this is the corollary why they fall down. Um, I mean, you don't want, as an architect, you don't want to have a problem. Nobody actually goes into this and says, yeah, hey, I love to hang out with lawyers. <laughs> on the other side of the room when they're grilling me with questions. Um, but so you just, there's certain things we have to be particularly cautious about. And then new materials. I, I mostly cover traditional materials in the two courses you get. I try to touch on some new materials. But as soon as you start to deal with new materials, as an architect, particularly for things that are not well researched and don't have a lot of really... Um, good, long, constructed example, something that's not been in use for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you need to exercise caution before you use it. So the case in point would be the cladding on the, the towers that's, that's burning up. It's a new material. It's not sufficiently tested anywhere. It hasn't been properly brought into the codes. People haven't, you know, maybe someone paid somebody off, but it, it just wasn't tested properly. So somebody that brings in a new material for you to, to use, you have to be cautious and say, well, where am I using it? Is it some place that it's going to be, is durability going to be an issue? Is it an interior fitment? Is it on the skin? Is it, a, is it potentially something that's going to go on fire? You know, sometimes if you're, if you're concerned that something is flammable and a salesperson is trying to sell it to you, bring out your Bic lighter. <laughs> Say, okay, does it burn? One way to find out. It's one way to find out. I remember going into a, into a, a, a mall in, in, in China, and, and my daughter was buying a pair of sunglasses. And the person was you know, trying to tell them that, oh, the, the lenses aren't plastic, they're glass. You know? So these are more, this is why we're charging you so much more, but these are glass lenses, not plastic. And they actually went, and they took a lighter out and put it in the middle of the and they didn't burn. We were really impressed, but it was like, oh my god. <laughs> but what about the frames? The frames might be plastic, the lenses we were worried about scratching, but yeah, I mean, test things. Something, you know, you're trying to use something, use it on something small scale before you use it on, you know, a, a, a thousand meter tall tower. Make sure 